For our next lesson, what we're going to do is we're going to try to animate a ball realistically following actual video reference that somebody has shot. Uh, you can shoot this yourself if you have a camcorder. Uh, you need to be aware of what the frame rate is, but there's a way for us to figure that out uh, even if you don't know on your native device. In this case, I've gone to YouTube and downloaded a video from some guys uh, that shot their own tennis ball reference, which is right here. Okay, I'll provide the link to the original video so that you can take a look at what they did. But I'm just going to be stepping through this uh, to analyze it and taking a recorded set of information that I'm going to use to animate. So there's a couple of ways you can go about this. First, you need to get your hands on the video file itself. Uh, there's a number of plugins for different browsers that help you download YouTube videos. I can provide some links for that uh, in the description. And there's also uh, a few websites that you can go to where you just copy and paste the original link to the video and they give you the ability to download it. Now the reason that we need to download the video is because we need to open it into QuickTime here so that we can step through frame by frame by using the left and right arrow keys to see every moment of the video as it happens. So I'll speed up to where the ball hits the ground. So I need to be able to record this frame specifically and I'm not aware of any other video software that lets you do this. Some of them appear to, but they actually jump several frames forward and backward, and we need to be able to see every individual frame. Okay, so you need QuickTime. Uh, you don't need to go pro. You don't need to upgrade to it. You can just get the free version of QuickTime, and you need to have a file format that will open in QuickTime. To my knowledge, FLVs, which is one of the options for download, are not appropriate. The MP4s are just fine. So here I have the MP4 open in QuickTime. And what I would do is I would go through and find every important location and time and mark them down. Now before I do that though, we need to know what frame rate this video plays at. Um, fortunately we know on YouTube almost all those videos I believe play at 30 frames per second. But here's how we can find out. Down in the left hand corner this time code in QuickTime begins on seconds, minutes, and hours. And we want to find the moment when the video switches from zero seconds to one second. So here it is right here, zero, one. Okay, by tapping on the right arrow key to navigate the playhead. Then we switch this time code over to frame number. And we can see that indeed it's 30 frames per second. So we had one second duration. We're at the 30th frame, it's 30 frames per second. Okay, so now we know what our FPS is, and I mark that first up in the top, as well as the name of the animation, just so I don't get confused with other uh, notes. Okay, so I first went forward to the point that I thought I should start my animation, which is after he's thrown it. I'm not going to animate a character with a hand, so I decided that here at the apex of this first toss is where I would start my notes. And so I mark that down um, in the frames that appear on the video. The second column are the uh, animation frames that I would start with. So I'm starting at frame 1 in my Maya file, even though this is frame 40. So as I go along, I'm translating all of those over. You could use an Excel document to do this automatically if you want to. I just like using a notepad because I can do a little bit of quick math in my head. Uh, and it's not that big of a deal and I have everything in a very very simplified uh, form that I can use when animating. Okay, The third column over here is to note what it is that I'm recording at that time. Making this uh, very verbose can be very helpful so if there's a lot of stuff going on you could say left wrist um, apex y translate you know something like that um, or just write it out in English um, you know wrist top of the arc or something like that but it needs to be descriptive enough that you know why this point was important. Okay, This last column over here, this fourth column, um, I usually don't include this on my notes, but this is a nice way to um, see that there's actually a pattern in both space and time happening here. In this case, uh, there's a 33 frame gap between these two apexes. Then there's a 28 frame gap, which is 5 less. Um, than the previous gap, just to show that this took less time between this apex and that one, between these two apexes, than 21, 19, 15, 13, and we can see that there's a diminishing amount of time between these two gaps and that the amount that they're changing is going down as well. 
which gives us that sort of parabolic diminishing arc that we saw in our diagram fall. So this is just to verify that some of the things that we think are happening are actually happening. Um, and this is a really great thing to do, this sort of analysis, so that you can see what's happening in reality and you can make decisions based off of that. Okay? This is not what I would actually animate yet because as you can see in some of these gaps it goes up and down and it stays the same sometimes. Here I've got a gap of four followed by two followed by three. Um, that's a little bit strange and probably due to the fact that as you step through in this video it's kind of hard sometimes to tell when the ball actually touches the ground or when it's actually reached the safe backs. In this case the ball has touched the ground on frame 58 which I've marked down right here as a hit but we've got the streak of the ball behind it because the frame rate was not fast enough to capture the ball between these two positions here and here so it's been exposed long enough to blur the ball's position um, over that frame that's not a big deal up here at the top of this arc though which one of these frames here is the actual top of that arc that can be a little bit difficult to say. I try to find a vertical marker such as the shine on this car here and try to see when is it the closest to it or the farthest pushed into it and when does it start to move down again. I think I chose 73. Let's take a look. Yeah, 73 is my apex uh, for this particular bounce. But sometimes it's pretty difficult to say. So here's an instance where we've got um, a contact on 88 but that could have just pushed up off the ground and we can't tell because of the blur. A little bit hard to say. As I step forward some more, that one looks pretty clear at frame, oh no, I marked it down at frame 101. But this time, okay, I could see why I would do that. So that time I was about to say that that was at frame 100. So these things are not exactly concrete sometimes. You just have to do your best to guess where those positions are. Okay. Getting these numbers a little bit wrong is not a huge problem. A one frame difference, you know, even a two frame difference is not necessarily uh, the end of the world. It's not going to ruin your animation. Because what we should do is we should adjust all of these numbers in the second column for animation after we've done our analysis. If you slavishly animate from exactly what it is that you viewed on the video, at best, your animation will be as good as the video. At worst, it will be much worse than the video because you will lack a context into which this motion was taking place and you won't have a structure and a pattern as clearly defined as it was in reality. Because there are things going down on the subframe level here that we can't necessarily see with the naked eye or even notice as we're stepping through. The relationship of the frames as they're moving is much more important than what's going on on an individual frame, any individual frame. So what I advise is that you do this analysis, write down everything that you saw and adjust it, then as the next step we're going to go through and adjust all of these numbers so that they follow a very clear pattern. We're not going to go crazy and adjust them three or four frames uh, to the, the future or the past, but we are going to put them into an order that establishes a better pattern. Just an extra note for this particular reference. There's several parts of this reference which make it a little bit difficult to analyze. One part is that the camera is moving. Okay, It's not a stationary camera so the perspective changes and we're gonna have to do measurements next and that's going to get in the way of that. Okay, um, Just be careful if you shoot your own reference you should try to get it on a steady camera on a tripod that nobody touches and you might also want to make markings in the environment so that you can more easily measure later. Um, this is not a big deal because it's a simple bouncing ball exercise so we're going to be just fine in this video but just something to take into account. Okay, So once this step has been done we move on to our next step which is to make a chart for what it is we're going to do physically.